that. Everybody should stay awake. And as Jim said, this is to some extent what I've been studying is landscape change, but particularly vegetation change and particularly forest change for, uh, yeah, this is the 40th field season in a row in Nahimas now this year. So um, our little field station, just a few little things here. This is kind of our field of view in geographically in the south end of the Rockies. Zooming into that little rectangle, you see the two dots. I've been based at the left dot there at Bandelier since 96, uh, 86, excuse me. Um, the, oops, yeah. The, so this has been my home landscape for a long time. Uh, and when I say place-based, I've had this rare opportunity to be able to live and work in a place, develop these relationships with the landscape and the people who live and work there, particularly land managers. And so been doing this science management partnership since 93, I have worked for a research agency, basically the USGS, the US Geological Survey, which has a lot of biologists and ecologists since that time. Um, but I've been co-located sitting here sharing an office with people at Bandelier, land managers, and working with all sorts of folks. Um, and the focus has been studying the history initially of this landscape, which is what I did my master's and PhD on. And ultimately, we'll see, expanding a little bit out even to the planet. Uh, I need to acknowledge Kay Bealey here on the left with under the red arrow. She, uh, she came to work with me in 1992 and you see on the right, all of those dots, those are all basically, most of those are vegetation uh, related plots. It's, uh, it's, we have data sets and Jim helped some of them, set some of them up starting in 91, Jim McGrath, um, early on. And, but we have 30 year data sets now on many different topics. And a lot of that is a testament to the um, consistency that Kay has provided. Uh, to the program through all these years. So um, she continues to work for Park Service. We kind of acted like the removing of the research people in 93 didn't happen. Looking at this landscape then, you're gonna see this field of view a lot uh, with various kinds of showing things like fires, patterns of things on the landscape, but the Jemez, as most of you I'm sure know, has this 15 mile diameter central caldera feature. And then these various land ownership, a lot of forest service, Vice Caldera National Preserve in the middle, Bandel here in the east, headquarters of the park here, Los Alamos to the north, and various Native American pueblos around. When you look at that larger spatial scale, Bandelier here in the east, well that was the plot network I showed you there, but We've done a similar thing with the Vice Caldera. So between the Caldera, which is now a National Park Service unit for a few years, and Bandelier, we have long-term ecological monitoring of along the elevational gradient of this mountain range from the Rio Grande to the rim of the Caldera that I think is unparalleled for a Western North America mountain range. Uh, topically, just an astounding amount of things that we've been able to study. Um, and develop long-term data sets on. And it makes the HAMA as a really rich laboratory for continued learning because once you have so much context from all these other studies, it's interesting to work on your particular specialty so it's attractive to other researchers to keep coming in. And one of the interesting things that's happened is on top of this long-term network of plots of water quality and soil carbon and stream flow and surface dwelling arthropods and vegetation and all birds and all kinds of things, there's been a lot of disturbance processes. What you just looked at are the footprints of fires by decade. You can see this, the legend in the bottom left corner, but we have a record back to 1909 of, of fire atlas records. And for the first uh, 90 years, that's all the little blue dot, blue stuff, and it's not very much, but the last 20 years, as you all know, who've been in New Mexico, there's been a lot of fire and a lot of landscapes, including the Jemez, and we'll talk more about that. 
This is looking at zooming out a little bit from satellite. So here's the Hamas side of the field station. But I also want to call out increasingly the center of gravity of the field station has shifted to the Santa Fe side, the Sangre de Cristo side. Uh, here on the left is Ellis Margolis. He's a dendroecologist. He's the future of the field station. It's in good hands, solid guy. He's been working for 21 years himself here in Northern New Mexico for us. The person on the right there, Ellis with this is uh, Tom Swetnam, who um, basically grew up in Hamas Springs, directed the tree ring lab for 16 years. And uh, he's sort of a, one of the most iconic world known dendroecologists on the planet. We're lucky to have him with us. So. There's actually a group of us now emerging as forest ecologists. For a long time, there weren't very many in New Mexico. So this is a little seed we've been trying to, I've been trying to water, I guess, a little bit. And Ellis, this is a network of fire history plots, for example, that you see in northern New Mexico. The different colors represent different uh, time periods and projects that funded them. but. We will talk both about the Jemez side and the Sangre de Cristo side in a little bit of detail because of the astounding things we can learn from the tree ring record. Um, so just backing up, one of the things that, one of the, the approaches that we, and is much more common scientifically now across the board, one of the approaches to take your local information from any one location pick your favorite little spot out in the landscape out there to see whether what's going on there is just a unique story or something that's part of a larger pattern is you combine it with information in a larger spatial network. So sometimes these networks are things that you can build yourself over time, like the one I'm showing you here, which is tree rings and fire history. But other times you scale up even further to interact with people across Western North America or even globally. And I'll give you some examples of how to do that. But formally, we've been doing something. The Southern Rockies node is basically our little field station. And with these other field stations, which are other based out of other national park units, Rocky Mountain National Park, Glacier, uh, Olympic North Cascades, and Sequoia Kings Canyon, Yosemite, we have for the last 20 plus years been similar long-term data sets in these other places and comparing and contrasting in something we call the Western Mountain Initiative. So I'm gonna get right into some good tree ring stuff here. And of course, uh, dendroecology was, was invented a century ago uh, by a man named Douglas down in, he started the laboratory tree ring research at the University of Arizona campus uh, there. And it's an amazing resource here. The variability between wet and dry years makes a strong variability in tree ring growth that made it easier to figure it out here. But you can do it in more places that where the climate variability is more subtle, including increasingly tropical forests we're finding the signal. But here we can find wood for over 2000 years over a thousand years on basically every mountain range we've looked. And one of the cool stories put together, you can reconstruct a lot of things, including it turns out temperature as well as precip. And this is a very important, I think, foundational paper about how temperature drives the title. This is the title of the article from 2013. Temperature is a potent driver of regional forest drought stress and tree mortality. And it was the cover article for that journal, Nature Climate Change. Park Williams was the lead author. He was a postdoc at Los Alamos that I and others were working with. And Park found a temperature signal in the tree ring record that people hadn't noticed before, had not noticed before. So he took all the tree measurement data from conifers in the Southwest, all these red dots. It was hundreds of thousands of measured tree rings and looked, analyzed it for the yellow area. So that's the region basically the Southwest, the monsoonal Southwest. And he reconstructed this index, two, two predictors that could predict tree growth with a R squared, a correlation coefficient of 0.9, which is an astoundingly strong measurement at the regional scale. 
This is that forest drought stress index, which you could also think of as tree growth for the last 1,000 years for Arizona, New Mexico, that yellow Southwest region. The red is a 10 year average line. The gray are the individual years, okay? And the point I wanna make with this is that you've probably seen tree ring reconstructions of climate before for this region and they look a lot like this. Uh, it's above the zero line is wet conditions, good tree growth. Below the zero line is stressful, dry conditions, poor tree growth. The look at the red line because the, the gray is so noisy. But what you see is that every 50 or so years, we kind of oscillate between wet and dry and wet and dry. And then there's some astounding dry periods, these so-called mega droughts. There's the late 1200s that drove the ancestral Puebloan people out of the Four Corners region. And um, including in particular, the Tewa speaking peoples of northern of the just say basically the Espanola Basin. Here's the late 1500s, the 1580s, which was thought to be the most severe mega drought in the last thousand years. Until there's the 1950s drought, but this drought, this only goes through 2007, this data, these data, but um, this drought is now officially, as of uh, about six weeks ago, Park has published and the drought we're in in the Southwest is now as severe as that late 1500s drought. And it's temperature driving it. And that's a threshold of tree killing. Basically, if you get to that level of forest drought stress in this index, we have evidence. We know the 50s drought, 1950s drought killed trees. We can see the late 1500s did as well. Um, and we certainly, as we're gonna discuss in a minute, see the recent drought the last 20 years kill a lot. And then I wanna highlight one year. This is the year 2002, this circle in the lower right corner of the graph. So that, and if you look across for the last thousand years, you'll see there is no year even close to as stressful as the year 2002. So through, t until this is again, only goes through 2007, objectively the tree rings of conifers in the Southwest are telling us that 2002 empirically was the worst year for tree growth in the last thousand years. Although I would tell you 2011, 12, 13 are challengers for it. And we don't have the regional data yet to compare it at that scale, but um, we're seeing the drought stress ramping up. But 2002, it's an important year to note and we'll show you why. Um, Basically, because since 2000, this drought that we've been in and are not out of yet um, has led to increasingly severe changes, these so-called uh, tipping points, where the system is fine until it's not, and, but it's combinations of trees dying from drought and heat stress and insects and fires. And these are all photos. This has all been my home landscape. I have Almost all the photos you see are mine, not because I'm a great photographer, but I carry a camera, a little one at least with me and stuff happens in the landscape. So if you're paying attention, you can get some pretty good images through time. And it turns out that temperature, one of the, the key features that Park identified in that paper is that we knew that wet winters and springs led to better growth the next year. What was not noted previous to Park's discovery there in that paper, looking at the tree rings, was that warmer temperatures during the growing season cause conifer trees to grow more poorly in the Southwest. And it turns out that that temperature signal was just as strong as the winter precip signal. And that was a surprise. The winter precip signal, everybody knew, but this temperature signal at a regional scale was a new, a new finding. And it, this signal is now showing up all around the planet and Park's identification of it here in the Southwest was a major advance. And so this, this paper is becoming a real, is a classic globally. Uh, why are we not wanting to advance? Okay. And what did that do on the ground? So this is what 2002 looked like in the east flank of the Hamas. 
So that is, for those of you that know, that's at the foot of the, the road going up to Los Alamos. The, the road to the White Rock goes this way. The Los Alamos road is off to the right. And all those orange trees are pinyons dying in October. And 18 months later, it looked like this. The red dot is the same tree. So this overnight, and those of you who, and many of you um, undoubtedly have seen this in your parts of New Mexico, but the period from 2002 to 2004, there was tree mortality all up and down the elevational gradient. Um, and on the ground in Bandelier, it killed 95% of the mature pinyons in the Bandelier Los Alamos area, that 2002 to 2003 event. And it killed juniper and it killed shrubs and ponderosa pine and Douglas fir and white fir and Engelmann spruce and corkbark fir. And it killed, <laughs> it killed uh, two thirds of the blue grama grass cover in the pinyon juniper woodlands on the transects that Jim McGrath helped establish in the summer of 1991. And some of those we still read every year. We have three million centimeters, three kilometers worth of individual centimeter by centimeter lying transect. We don't read them all every year. But it was not just bark beetles got the press, but what was killing the vegetation from grasses and shrubs to different tree species is the drought and heat stress of that extreme year. But it wasn't just the Jemez or the Southwest US, it was all across Western North America. So this is a map through the lens of the eyes of bark beetle biologists, entomologists who study bark beetle outbreaks. The different colors represent different species of bark beetles, tree killing bark beetles. And this blue one, pinyon ips, is the one associated with the pinyon mortality in the four corners. There's many species that'll kill other, other pines, but we're talking absolutely unprecedented in the historical record, which goes back to the late 1800s, to have this scale of insect impact. This is more than 25 million acres in British Columbia alone of, of uh, lodgepole pine and mountain pine beetle. So, but what's, the insects often get depressed, but again, what underlies it is the drought and heat stress. More recently, uh, from 2012 to 2016, it was California's turn, the Sierra Nevada, something on the order of 150 million trees died in 2015, 2016. Um, but it's global as well. And with working for about 15 years now, working with colleagues, sort of, I got jump started with it by the impact of this in our local landscape. But again, networking, scaling up, working with colleagues around the planet, we see that from Australia to Alberta to Algeria to Argentina to Albania. Trees are dying during droughts now in ways that are historically not, well, they're unprecedented. And it's the warming signal is starting to drive that. In 2010 with 19 co-authors, I, I led publication of this paper. And um, this, sort of literally put this, this uh, phenomenon on the map. We just put dots on the map where people had published in the last 25, 30 years, since 1980, uh, drought and heat induced tree mortality. And it turns out it's, again, from the Amazon to Alberta, it's not just in dry places on the planet. It includes some of the wettest places as well. We'll come back to this tree mortality, but I'll just say that this phenomenon is, is quite worrisome um, in the sense because it turns out that, that trees really are more sensitive to temperature than we thought and the drying effects of temperature on the atmosphere, pulling, pulling, the, the, pulling moisture, trying to pull moisture out of the plants through their stomata as well as from the soil. And there's a lot more that could be said about that, but we won't say it here. Um, just a little bit more of some longer, deeper history than tree rings can provide. So this is a paper, Peter Fawcett is a geologist at UNM, works with pollen. And with a big team of folks, 
he led this paper that several of us, both uh, myself with USGS and some folks at Los Alamos, took a 90 meter sediment core out of the lake sediments. It's a drill rig like you would see for oil and gas there in the middle of the Valle Grande near the East Fork of the Jemez River. We pulled out a quarter million years worth of sediment record from the old lake beds, from the lakes that used to be there. Oops, sorry. And I don't want you to look close at this slide, but because uh, there's a lot of stuff in here, but the bottom is age in years, thousands of years before present. So that core goes from 360,000 years before present to 552,000 before present. And the, the orange bars represent dry periods in the record. And it was a lake throughout that entire time. But if you see this zone here, it says mud cracks. We think this interglacial period, marine isotope, isotope stage 16, 13. So it was alternating between glacial, interglacial, cool, wet glacial, warm, dry interglacial, and then back to glacial. In this interglacial, um, that lake dried out enough that that it actually dried to the place where the core was taken, there were mud cracks. It seemed like it was still sort of wet. But these kinds of natural climate variability have happened in the past. What's different is the rapidity of the, and the magnitude of the change that our anthropogenic effects are having. Looking a little more closer in time, the fellow in the ball cap here, the red ball cap is Scott Anderson, a professor at Northern Arizona University. He uh, studies, again, pollen and charcoal from lake records and bogs, but usually not so far back as that lots of them for the last 20, 30,000 years. And these are all sites. The triangles are places we cord lakes and bogs, working with Scott and his, some of his grad students. These two sites in the Jemez are, are shown in photographs, Alamo Bog on the west side of the caldera, in Chihuahuanos bog, and we have a 9,000 and 15,000 year record respectively from each of these. And I'm gonna show you for Chihuahuanos um, what the charcoal record looks like. And so this graph, don't be daunted by this, it's actually very simple. On the left axis is depth of the core. So the core showing down 400 centimeters, so four meters. And it's about 15,000 years down there at the bottom. And then what is graphed here is how many particles of charcoal per cubic centimeter, centimeter by centimeter, all 400 of them down through the length of that core. And the thing I wanted to show you is that the last ice age ended around 11,000 years ago. And there was very little, so this period down the bottom, physically half of the core, was during that cool, wet glacial period, and there was very little fire activity as represented by charcoal. But then by about 9,000 years before present, the modern summer monsoon system set up, and we got huge amounts of charcoal, you know, 5,000, 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. These are astoundingly large amounts of charcoal. Even these areas here, a couple hundred years ago that looked like zeros or not, those are still hundreds of particles. The only place that that core in the last 10,000 years is zero is here since 1890. This was sampled in 1996. If we sampled it today, I'm sure we'd find charcoal at the top because this bog partly burned over in 2013 in the Thompson Ridge fire. But the point of showing this is, is that the period, the last nine, 10,000 years, the Holocene is the period of the human civilization as we know it and call it developed in that time period. It's been a relatively stable climatic episode, an interglacial period that's been good for things like agriculture and the growth of human populations. And the biggest anomaly in that last 9,000 years from a fire standpoint is the last well, back to the late 1800s, okay? The zeros here. So this is the period of fire suppression, and we'll talk about that from a tree ring 
standpoint, and I'm sure you all know this story, but the point I want to make here is that this period of the last 120 or 30 years without significant surface fire activity from our fire suppression efforts is hugely anomalous at the scale of many thousands of years. It's, it's, so it's a big change in the system and it had consequences on the vegetation that we're seeing the outcome of today. So hmm, the text is missing here. Um, but we're going to look at fire up and down this elevational gradient from both low severity fire and high severity fire using tree ring records here. And again, Ellis, I've been working with people like Ellis and Tom Swetnam since the mid 1980s building this network for this area. And it's astounding what we can do going back. We can go more than a thousand years uh, with fire records in this part of the world although the number of samples drops off after about 500 years ago. Um, I will just note that a lot of the fire history we talk about are frequent surface fires in ponderosa pine forests or dry or mixed conifer forests, because that's what dominates much of the forest setting in, in Arizona and New Mexico. But in the higher elevation, the subalpine forests of spruce fir, the wetter dug fir, spruce fir, and up. Natural, it's important to emphasize that high severity crown fires are a natural part of these systems. And Ellis is the guy who studied these for both his master's and PhD, reconstructing the history of crown fires, largely by looking at big aspen stands and precisely dating the year which those aspen regenerated and comparing it to scarred trees on the margins of the stand that survived. Um, and you get dates that match. And so you can be pretty sure it was a crown fire that started that. Anyway, crown fire is natural, but it doesn't affect a very large part of the landscape pre-1900. Um, and when it happens, it can be slow coming back. We can use other lines of evidence, air uh, ground and air photos. There's a photograph of Santa Fe Baldy just north of the ski basin. And there it was. Uh, that fire, by the way, that triggered that from the fire scar record was 1880. And so 36 years later, there still was very, if, if you don't have much aspen come up, these spruce forests can be slow. Even that's 120 years post fire and it's still filling in. But we're going to talk more about these surface fires because these are so dominant and this is what has been the big change in fire behavior. So from the Hamas, this is arguably the world's most intensively sampled mountain range, a million acre size mountain range on the planet from a tree ring fire history standpoint. The different colors represent different time periods and studies. We basically pieced this together over, well, over the last 35 years. Um, we didn't have funding to do it all at once, but with but more than 1,600 scarred trees, more than 11,000 precisely dated fire scars, and fire scar dates back into the 1100s here. Um, well, this would be easier to do if I was there in person. It's a little hard to do this, staring at a computer screen. Just say each one of these sites, each one of these horizontal lines is the time history in calendar years at the bottom. So there's 1100 to the year 2000. Each one of the horizontal lines represents the composite of one of 90 sites. So those 1600 trees are distributed. There's like close to 20 trees at a, at a site, like 18, 19 trees on average. And this is the, at least 10, if 10% 10 of the trees at the site showed a scar, it's recorded here as a tick mark. The main point about this is there's an immense amount of fire activity for the last 400 years where we have a lot of samples to see it. Um, but you notice it stops by 1900 almost everywhere. That's that same gap that shows up in the charcoal record in bogs in this part of the world, but we can more precisely date it with tree rings. So yeah, basically by 1900 to the left of that and to the right of it, it's a whole different thing. From this spatial network, the green is the older stuff that basically I pulled together 
in the last four years, the Red Dots, Ellis went out and with our team systematically gridded and sampled all the spaces we didn't get to so that we could model it spatially. So this modeling work is just underway. It's not published yet, but I'll show you a few maps that Ellis is pulling together. So this is the year, and I can't see it, but I believe it says 1748. My little Zoom thing is blocking the year at the top, uh, which is inconvenient. I wonder if I can fix that. No, I can't. Anyway, going back, so the point here, so this is the Hamas Mountains. This is that network of fire history sites. The, if you see a colored dot, it represents a tree that has a fire scar in that year. So I believe this year is 1748. Again, I can't see it. Um, actually, I can if I do that. Yeah, 1748. Um, the different colors represent actually the season of the fire within the year. I'm just going to get the years of these other uh, 42, 47, 51. Thank you. Okay. So, so the point here is that so this is the Hamas landscape where high elevation is light colored, low elevation is dark colored. So you see the central caldera and the Rio Grande Gorge here and the Hamas River Gorge, there's San Diego Canyon. This, if you imagine a perimeter around in the year 1748, fire would burnt most of the Hamas mountains. By way of context, that is this blue outline is the footprint of the Las Conchas fire. That's 156,000 acres. At the time, the largest fire in recorded New Mexico history. Well, all the Dendro fire people, we all knew these modern fires were way smaller than pre-1900 fires in terms of footprint. What's different is the severity of these, and we'll show you that in a minute. But, but I wanna show you how common these big fires were. So that's 1748 which was, by the way, probably the biggest fire year in Western North America, certainly in the Southwest. Almost every mountain range in the Southwest has similar patterns to this. There's 1847, I believe, um, if I remember right, because again, I can't see the dates on my screen, but you can see 1847, again, much of the, most of the Hamas is burning, certainly bigger than the Las Conchas footprint. There's 1851, just four years later, we had another fire bigger than the Las Conchas. And I think, what was this, 1856? No, that's 1851. So was it 18, oh, 1842, 47, 51. Yeah. So within 10 years, between 42 and 1851, there were three fires with footprints larger than the Las Conchas fire. But these fires are not killing the trees that are recording these fires, right? These are surface fires burn extensively through grassy fuels and needle litter on the ground, keeping the forest open. You had this sort of ranging from savannas to low density forests in systems of ponderous pine. So keep that in mind about how common these big widespread surface fires were. Just very briefly, this is the Sangre de Cristo side. Santa Fe is here. This is the Santa Fe River water basin and adjoining watersheds, uh, which has been super intensively sampled to get uh, for land managers <laughs> to support land management actions to protect the drinking water supply of Santa Fe. This is up in the Taos Ski Valley area. We've been doing work there, uh, trying to get the watersheds, three watersheds from the Ski Valley through uh, Rio Pueblo de Taos, through the Taos land, tribal lands to the, to the watershed just to the south and a number of other sites. So if we just look at the Santa Fe River watershed basins, zooming in, the dots start to look like this. Um, again, different kinds of sampling methods through time, but just in that area, you get a very similar pattern, tons of fire history before 1900, nothing afterwards, literally nothing. You do get a little bit earlier cessation of grazing and, and um, 
cessation of fire history as a response to early grazing in this area near Santa Fe. We think the sheep grazing uh, had an impact sooner there. Again, big fires burning. This little dashed line is the closed part of the Santa Fe watershed. So the municipal drinking water supply with two reservoirs, uh, Nichols and McClure down there, about 40%. Notice this upper part of the watershed not showing these surface fires. That upper part burned in 1685 in a stand replacing fire that Ellis dated. So again, I'm not seeing the dates. Maybe that's 1748, is that 1842? Um, anyway, surface fire was important in like every mountain range in the Southwest. This is what those surface fires used to look like. Why did they stop? The answer is actually economics. When railroads reached New Mexico, which happened literally in 1880, railroads reached uh, the foot of the Jemez at Española and Santa Fe. By the 1890 census, it, it took this isolated economic landscape of subsistence agriculture in New Mexico and connected it to outside markets. There was all kinds of land uh, stealing shenanigans and massive exploitation of natural resources, including livestock grazing. There were, and it was year round grazing. There were 5 million sheep and a million and a half cattle by the 1890 census. And basically grazing year round and they ate the grassy fuels the fire spread through and you got fire suppression accidentally as an outcome of overgrazing several decades before active fire suppression was a policy did not happen until 1910. Meanwhile, the response of forests to this land use change was the surface fires had been a thinning agent and the forest densified. And again, I think everybody knows this st story, but I would just note they densified at the scale of a stand, right where you're a forest stand, where you're standing and looking at it, both horizontally and vertically, the fuels increased in density, including these ladder fuels, which lets fire get from the ground to the canopy. And it happened at the landscape scale. It used to be south facing slopes in the Jemez. This is Cerro Grande. This is a photograph taken about 1990 from an airplane looking north along the east rim of the caldera. There's the Valle Grande. That's for those of you that know the Jemez, Cerro Grande, oops, Cerro Grande, Pajarita Mountain, uh, Cañada Bonito, Caballo, uh, the highest peak, Chacoma and Pulvedera Peak, all of these had grasslands on the south facing slopes. I studied those for my master's thesis in the early 80s. And in 1935, the air photos, all of this area of forest in this interior slope of Cerro Grande, the south facing slope, had just a few old grandmother trees in it. That all filled in in the 20th century in the absence of fire. The point being that not only individual stands densified, but at a landscape scale, the forest filled in with trees and fuels. And what that means is that previously a fire couldn't be carry as a crown fire pre-1900 on these south facing slopes. It had to drop to the ground because there was no continuous canopies. But that changed. And now what we're seeing <coughs> in the last 20 years since we went into this episodic drought, which is probably just natural fluctuations in the Pacific driving kind of 10 to 25 year drought cycles or episodes. They're not quite cyclic, but it's warmer now. And that warming means longer fire seasons, drier fuels, more explosive fire behavior, and, um, and with human ignitions in the mix. And we are getting fires that we cannot suppress anymore because of that combination of hotter drought more severe fire weather, and this buildup of fuels, the powder kegs that built up in these mountain forests for over a century of fuel accumulation. And this is mapping back to 1909. It'll be, I think, by decade. No, there's the first 80 years of fire records. People suppressed fire successfully pre-World War I with shovels on horseback. And this green fires represent the 1970s when we first started to pop a few big fires. And then we went into a wet period from 78 to 95, 1995, fire suppression worked again. But as soon as we got to 90, the late 90s, it dried out. 
starting in 96 and we got fires we couldn't suppress, these blue fires in the 1990s. There are the 2000s fires. This one here on the east is Cerro Grande. 43,000 acres, wow, declared the biggest fire in New Mexico history at that time, not. But there's the first four years of the 2010s, the footprint of Las Conchas and the Thompson Ridge fire. So what we see is the footprints of the fires are getting larger, even though we have more capacity to throw at fire control, but we're not able to keep a lid on it now. But again, as an ecologist, I'm not worried about the footprint Fire is a natural part of these systems. It's fires used to be bigger than this, right? We saw a 10 year period in the mid 1800s when there were fires much bigger than Las Conchas that repeatedly burned the, the whole central part of the Hamas, but they weren't killing the mother trees, right? So this is a reminder of that, how widespread those fires were. What we care about is the patchy, the pattern of high severity fire how much of the fire footprint is tree killing fire. I'm gonna show you that. So this is sort of a satellite image Landsat before all the big bad fire. And this is tree killing fire from just the period of 96 to 2013. And it doesn't have all the little fires, only the big ones where these kind of analyses were done, but you can see it's pretty much blown out the forests in the east flank of the Hamas. Um, huge areas, tens of thousands of acres with almost no surviving conifer trees in contiguous patches. This was the Cerro Grande day one and two run. Uh, this is day one of Las Conchas here before it moved north. This is Thompson Ridge, that's the lakes fire. I'm gonna skip this, but you can see this time series, basically fires are just, I'll just skip to this. Here is air photo from, I think this is 1991. And you see all the dark, there's Los Alamos, the caldera, the town site in the lab, Bandelier, the Rio Grande. This is all the upland forest area. And watch what happens to it toggling between 2016 and 1991. You see the forest, that green conifer canopy cover has gone away. It has literally gutted the forests on the east flank of the Hamas, and this has huge consequences. Oh, they're zooming in above Los Alamos, and we'll see it again. So astounding, literally overnight changes in, uh, yeah, and these are, these were old growth forests. This east flank of the Hamas was the largest uh, section of, of 400 plus year old trees in the mountain range. That one fire, the Las Conchas fire is, kind of a harbinger of the future. This tree is the tree that triggered Las Conchas. This was taken two months post fire. That tree fell on June 26, 2011, a Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m. And it broke this little two line power line, which has been restrung by August. And the fire started right here and burned. You can see it still burned. The summer rains came, it greened up a little bit. Ironically, the tree that triggered the fire did not even burn. But the wind was blowing toward us, or a little bit toward the left corner, bottom left corner of the screen. This is a photograph taken less than an hour after ignition from the fire tower to the south as it was being evacuated. Those flame lengths are somewhere 400, 500 foot in length. You don't normally even see them when these running crown fires are up and running because there's so much smoke. But he, the lookout, Jeff Dubay, caught a cool picture of this thing. You can't see the base of the flames. They're on the other side of that little ridge line. Um, that fire got up and ran. And uh, yeah, it burned 156,000 acres, 60% of Bandelier. And in the, first, in the first 14 hours, it burned the whole footprint. 43,000 acres of the Cerro Grande fire. And it burned almost all of that at high severity fire. This is all day one of that fire from the dense forests on the Caldera Rim, Upper Bland Canyon to Cochiti Canyon, which burned from the rim almost to the Rio Grande, took out Dixon's Apple Orchard, for those of you who knew that place. And one of the big deals with this is it's killing the mother trees that are required for conifer tree regeneration in this part of the world. So we have these huge areas. And if you go more than about 100 meters, 150 from a, from a mother 
say ponderosa pine or douglas fir there's very little seed gets there a lot of studies have worked on that there's a lot of re-sprouting plants up in the higher elevation zones ranging from aspen to many shrub species down in the lowest drier areas that burned the recovery has been really slow uh, this is down uh, in the dome wilderness on forest service near the southwest corner of bandelier and that's the same tree that toppled a year after it burned this was two months post fire we don't know what's coming next but i can tell you the dominant plant you're seeing there in the field of view at that time was actually tumbleweed russian thistle um, but a little higher elevation a lot of re-sprouting plants basically we are favoring these kind of high severity and increasingly frequent severe disturbance processes favor plants that re-sprout. They select against long-lived trees that don't re-sprout. So things like shrubs, oak shrub and rabinia, uh, large areas are what we're calling type conversion from forest to shrubland or combinations of shrubland and grassland. Of course, one of the other big effects is, is on watersheds. <coughs> huge effects, you get hundred fold increases in the peak flood flows post fire. Prior to a fire in these watersheds, you had not only the dense forest canopy, but uh, actually an unusually thick hundred year buildup of needle litter. So you had this really uh, impressive sponging effect that all gets incinerated literally overnight in a high severity fire. And for about two years, you get flooding that again we can't manage nor control and um and we've seen this with all of the fires there starting from the 96 dome fire actually since the 77 la mesa fire so well documented that peak flows go from maybe 80 cubic feet per second from a thunderstorm to 8,000 cubic feet per second um, with debris flows choking both ripping out the bottoms of the canyons the riparian zones, but also burying them in debris. Uh, big effects on water quality downstream. You may recall after Las Conchas, Albuquerque had to shut its water intakes for like eight weeks on the Rio Grande. Go back to the well system because it was so turbid. Santa Fe had to do the same thing for about a month. Uh, yeah, the, the amount of energy released in these canyon bottoms is amazing. We're doing research right now we're in the, the analysis and write-up phase, but the last three summers have been looking at the recovery of several canyon systems in Bandelier, uh, Frijoles Canyon and Capuline from top to bottom. And we look like we've lost some plant species in some of these canyon systems, uh, in, including uh, Ulnus oblongifolia, beautiful, the big, the big alder that grows in this part of the world. Um, seems to have been lost from the Capulin Canyon system. We can't find it anymore. Um, this is what it did to, this is mid Frijoles Canyon, just west of Ponderosa, or, or excuse me, south of Ponderosa Campground, the crossing. There's what it looked like the fall before Las Conchas. There's what it looked like a month after the fire, before the flooding. There's what it looked like after several major floods. You can't even recognize the site. <clears throat> anyway, this is the project I was telling you about. We're working on this thing. And this is the tree species. We've lost the only known locality in the Hamas for yellow lady slipper orchids in Ferrellis Canyon, uh, a, a fern species, um, a couple orchids that are, are present elsewhere, but not in that, not in that watershed anymore. Um, and we're seeing that from all these fires. That's on the Sangre side. Uh, of course, the Incibato fire, amazing. I did not take that photo. It should, have, should be credited. It was a guy from the Albuquerque Journal. Um, but yeah, if you're just awake in these landscape, the rest of these are all photos I took of these things blowing up. And the amount of energy being released is colossal. I mean, it's right photosynthesis being stored in plant matter for a century. That's uh, just the... So where is it going in the future? So that's... We did the past, we've done what's going on recently. We're seeing forests dying from combinations of drought and heat stress, insect outbreaks related, and high severity wildfires. What's the future looking like? Well, the world's getting warmer, <laughs> as we know. Uh, 
significantly. And the climate models, this is, this is the famous hockey stick uh, image of the last thousand years of, of uh, northern hemisphere temperature from tree rings and corals and other paleo proxy values with the air bars around it. But here's the 20th century where the warming starts to kick in. <clears throat> These are projections for the 21st century of how many degrees C since, you know, Celsius warming, so times 1.8 to get Fahrenheit. Um, and we are on the fast track. Although the COVID pandemic maybe has slowed us down a little bit, but what happened after the 2008 recession year was it kicked in even stronger the next year. But we are on the track toward five degrees C right now. And that's even without some bad biophysical feedbacks that are not modeled very well, including actually forest die off on the planet. And we're seeing things like this happen all over. This was, this was a cumulative image for put NASA put together of area burned in Australia in the month of December. So pretty astounding. And 2019 was both the hottest year and the driest year continentally in the instrumental record back to 1890, whatever that is. And just astounding fire behavior that, again, they hadn't seen, but so the, these mega droughts are triggering mega fires and mega tree dieback events as well, increasingly. And uh, yeah, it's just the same kind of stuff we've been seeing here in Western North America, they got in spades this year. And <laughs> for those of us, it's, there's not a debate about whether the climate is changing and whether it's changing the behavior of these kinds of phenomena. It's a question of what we do about it. And it's such a shame that this country, and I'm editorializing, these reflect my own perspectives, not those of the agency I work for, but it's such a shame that we're not having our debates about what to do about this, on which there's, of course, many economic kinds of policies and social policies that could be there's options and trade-offs there, rather than debating whether it's real or not. But yeah, how's the canary doing? Well, as the little guy in the corner says, it's done, well done. And so in summary, we're seeing that warming increases the frequency, severity, and extent of forest disturbances on this planet. And things often do fine, but because there's, but there are these non-linearities, these tipping points in the system, and we're always surprised when we hit those tipping points. If you were here, and I'm sure many of you were, in the 1980s and early 1990s, that was the best 15 year window for growth in the last thousand years. It was a great place to be a tree in the Southwest US. Since the late 90s, the last 20 years, it's become existentially marginal, whether conifers are gonna survive the next 40, 50 years, um, except probably in Little Refugia. Um, the system can change more quickly than people expect. There's new things going on. This is uh, insect, new insect outbreak dynamics. The winners of 27 to 2019, this is uh, in the upper Santa Fe River watershed. The Santa Fe ski basin would be just sort of left of the field of view here. You're looking east. And all of that browning is from a little caterpillar that of a little brown moth called Janet's looper that actually chews on, most of that is Douglas fir, although it also chew on spruce, but it chews on the needles in the winter and it doesn't completely consume them, but it damages the needles enough to, uh, to, uh, to, kill the, to cause the, the browning. There was never a record of this organism, of this little caterpillar in Northern New Mexico prior to that warm set of winters. It was only one other recorded outbreak from the Lincoln National Forest in Southern New Mexico, like 20 years ago. But presumably this is a warming phenomenon, allowing this to push its way north and do what it does in the wintertime that it didn't used to be able to do up in the cold North Mountains. And then this is actually for me kind of the hardest part to share, but it turns out that warming is particularly bad news 
for the ancient iconic big old trees on planet Earth, uh, including, and I sent this to Jim to send out to the membership. This article came out in Science a week ago, uh, led by a colleague, Nate McDowell, long at Los Alamos National Lab. Now he's still in Northern New Mexico living, but works for Pacific Northwest Lab. But alphabetically, I got second authorship, but it was really a very much a co-written set of papers or a paper. But the bottom line of this paper is what pervasive shifts in forest dynamics is that warming is cranking up all these disturbance processes, drought and heat stress, insect outbreaks, wildfire, wind throw, and lightning even. The warming for every one degree C temperature rise in the atmosphere, the amount of ground strike lightning goes up on the order of 12%. So at four degrees C over the course of this century, that's a 50% rise in lightning. And lightning disproportionately affects big old trees, as does wind throw. And wind speeds are increasing on the planet because there's more energy in the atmosphere, more convectional power, creating more lightning, more strong storms, winds, downdrafts. Anyway, many different disturbance processes, they're all warming related. And the bottom line of it is, is that trees that forest old trees are being selected against by these, these new regime of processes and forests are getting shorter and younger and the species composition is mix is changing as well. And, um, and that's true here in New Mexico as it is around the planet. And, um, and for those of us who love big old trees and the legacies, the history, the continuity, they represent both ecologically, the biodiversity, the disproportionate amount of carbon that they store in big stems. In tropical moist forests, the largest 1% of trees by diameter, if you look at just the 1% biggest trees in a tropical rainforest, they can store as much as 80% of the above ground biomass. That's how important big old trees are from a carbon storage standpoint in in ecosystems. And of course, big old trees have whole communities in the, in the canopies, different biodiversity, and then they mean things to people. Anyway, we are losing them here as well. The, the, both the, the, we see that trees, their, their growth, they're stressed disproportionately by warming for reasons that we don't have time to talk about, and they die disproportionately during warm drought events. These are natural responses. The forests, ecosystems, the organisms, the individual species are all readjusting as they must to a rapidly changing environment, including changing disturbance processes and the warmer and drier climate in particular. We shouldn't be as surprised as we are. <laughs> it may not seem like that much to warm the planet one degree C, but that's a huge difference because it's not just the mean, it, the extremes are, are more extreme than that. Um, nonetheless, these are natural disturbance processes. They may be being amped up or changed in ways by the warming, but we can work with these processes. It's not all bad news. Die-off does natural thinning of forests, doesn't usually kill all the trees of any given species. There's proven management treatments we can mechanically we can buy time at the least for our forests, both from drought and heat stress by reducing the number of small stems competing with the old trees, as well as reducing the ladder fuels so that fire doesn't get into the canopies in, a, in an unhistorical way. So there are these kinds of things as forest caretakers, we can do these things. Um, we can be smart, we can do these reductions in density, basically thinning from below, favoring, the things we care most about from a biodiversity and watershed standpoint. Strategically, we can't treat most of the landscape. It's too expensive, it's too remote, but we can be strategic about where we place our treatments at a landscape scale. We should focus on old trees and the values associated with them. And we should be promoting as best we can the ability of these ecosystems to incrementally respond rather than being kind of transformed overnight by disturbance processes that they did not evolve with. 
And we do need to act with some urgency because nature's already responding as she must. And the key thing is there, we've got to do this. We've got to work together. We have, this is a place where good information matters um, because there are people who claim to love the forest who are so afraid of management action that they oppose all action. And basically those people in, are condemning <laughs> the big old trees they claim to love. Um, you can see places like the Gila where natural fire or it is where the fire, the landscape was big enough that from the late 70s on, 1970s, fires could be allowed to burn in the Ponderosa Pine Zone. And so there have been in some places four, five, six natural fires since then from lightning starts. That these places are surviving the, the high severity fires. Uh, that's repetitive. In managing for a more uncertain future range of variability. We can't, the, the, the genie's out of the bottle. We can, if we change energy paths, we can reduce the rate of warming, but we have already committed this planet to, even if, even if we stop putting extra CO2 completely into the planet, into the atmosphere today, the half-life of the CO2 that's up there is hundreds of years. It will still be warming the planet for a while. Because of this change in the situation, there's an immense amount of societal learning by everyone moving forward. Not just scientists, land managers, the public at large. We have to be communicating. We need to be learning together and, and working together. So despite the bad news out there, and I'm sorry that the news is bad enough for the forests in the Southwest in particular, but despite the risks and uncertainties, these are all different kind of possibilities in places on the landscape. It's not predestined. It has to end in that left-hand side kind of outcome. But we can tell you the bottom right is not sustainable in a warmer, drier climate. We need to move it toward many of our forests, toward things like the upper right. Challenges, and that could be a question somebody might have. Well, that's fine in Ponderosa of Pine where that was historically the natural quote unquote system, but what about something like spruce fir? That's something to talk about. But again, in conclusion, despite the risks, there are hopeful opportunities and options. And I would emphasize we need to act with urgency. We need to work collaboratively. We need to continue to learn and we should expect surprises. And with that, I end. So thank you.